Next up is Tuli Food um, from the Open Robotics, presenting seedal improvements and ROS integration. Uh, Tuli is the ROS platform manager. Um, and please take it away. Thanks, Ramon. Um, so I'm here, and I'm going to tell you a lot about uh, the projects that we work on, ROS and Gazebo. Uh, this is going to be sort of a high-level overview, um, trying to get you interested, because there's way too much there for me to actually talk about. Uh, just to get a sense of the room, how many of you have used ROS? How many of you used ROS2? Awesome. <clears throat> uh, as Lorenz mentioned, we're growing the community, and right now a lot of PX4 and the drone community is very focused on being on the vehicle, on the robots, uh, but we need to start looking beyond, the, beyond that. <clears throat> So, uh, as Ramon mentioned, I'm from Open Robotics, and we're, um, we have a mission, which is to create open source hardware and software and promote open, robotic, open source robotics in all different realms. And through that, <coughs> uh, we have about 30 people now distributed worldwide. We have our main office is in uh, Mountain View. We have an office in Singapore, and we have several remote workers from all around the world. The two main projects that we work on are ROS and Gazebo. ROS is an open source framework for robots. Um, and Gazebo is a 3D physics-based simulator um, that we've been working with the PX4 team to help integrate and leverage. I'm not going to give a whole lot of overview of those, because it sounds like most of you have heard about that. Um, but what is new and exciting is that there are new versions. There's ROS2 coming along as well as Gazebo Ignition, which is both of which are ground-up rewrites of ROS and Gazebo. So, <clears throat> ROS is now almost 11 years old. Uh, it's great, it's awesome. Uh, there's a lot of things that we learned from doing it, and we wanted to start over and resolve some of those issues that were preventing people from putting them into products and things like that. Um, so the first focus we are looking on is quality and design, system reliability. We want to support real-time use cases, which is something that we explicitly scoped out of the design of ROS1. Um, pushing towards certification is super important for us um, because it's important for you and other users in, say, the automotive space, which is another place that wants to pick up ROS2 heavily. Um, but we want to maintain all those wonderful features, like the flexibility of the communication that has been shown to be so valuable in ROS1. And the other thing that in ROS1 we noticed is that we can't scale down to small processors, say microcontrollers, that many of you want to use. And as we look forward um, to getting larger and larger systems, there's more IoT, there's more stuff that's going to be down on the smallest embedded platforms. And to that end, just last month we released ROS2 Dashing. It is our first LTS release of ROS2. We'll be supporting it for two years. Um, and this ha basically now has coverage of a lot, all the core primitives that you think of in terms of what the core of ROS did for you. In terms of maturity, this is probably similar to ROS Sea Turtle, if any of you were using ROS back then. Um, there's a lot of space to grow. There's a lot of functionality to be there. And we're going to be growing and filling that in faster because we're actually porting from ROS1 to ROS2, not writing everything from scratch. We know a lot, and we can make it go a lot faster. Another project for ROS2 that I want to highlight, particularly because of this community running on a microcontrollers, is MicroROS. This is specifically leveraging the DDS XRCE specification that make ROS2 run well on microprocessors. Or sorry, microcontrollers, not just on microprocessors. Uh, this is an active project that's going on. Um, and it's not complete yet, but it should be able to be used in the near future. I also mentioned automotive use cases. Um, we have the AutoWare Foundation is using ROS2 as its core, as well as Apex.ai, and they are working with us closely to work towards certification, including ISO 26262 and MISRA and other compliance measurements to make sure that we can be use it in safety-critical systems
Uh, there's a lot going on with Ross. Uh, if you want to find out more, if you speak Japanese, you can show up in, at RossCon Japan in September. Um, if not, you can come to the main RossCon event in Macau, which will be in uh, end of October into November, uh, actually on Halloween. Um, we're looking forward to it. It's an event like this. Um, it's a little bit bigger. We're going to be probably closer to 750 people this year. So... Um, talking a little bit more about Ignition Gazebo, um, again, it's a long-standing project that we have learned a lot, and we wanted to push it to the next level, and to do that, we started from the beginning. Our main focus has been, our priorities have been physics, make sure it works well, make sure it works quickly, and it's reliable. Um, make sure we have good sensors, sensor models, noise models, to allow you to accurately simulate your sensors. Um, extension points and modularity so that you can take it and build the application that you need it to be. It's not just what we can provide. You can take what we provide as a core and extend it. And modularity, we broke it up into a bunch of smaller libraries instead of being um, uh, one monolithic code base. Um, <clears throat> we have lots of physics engines, uh, maximal and reduced coordinate system solutions, depending on what type of physics problem you're solving. Um, I'm going to not go through all these details for the sake of time. Uh, sensing, you can see here an example of the noise model being applied, so that when you look at the ca simulated camera data, there's actually like noise that would be com coming from the camera. Um, whereas the simulation in the simulator, it's you know the, the world is solid. Um, there's a full plug-in API to allow you the extensibility. You have control of every single element of the physics. You can um, put synthetic actors into the world. You can put um, objects. You can tweak the world. You can change anything in the world. You can unload the world and load a new world. All of that is available via API. You have full control. And of course, the modularity I mentioned, we've split up the ignition uh, ignition code base into one, two, three, four, five, nine different projects. And um, this allows you to take them, modify them, and also reuse them. We have things like Ignition Math, which is just a very simple math library. Um, it's released, it's available upstream from Debian and Ubuntu. And if you just want a simple math library that's going to do your basic transform math, um, like what we use inside of the physics engine, it's there and available. And <clears throat> Similarly, Ignition Blueprint came out last month. Uh, the main features are physics-based rendering. That's the one that I think will be most uh, interesting to in this community, and I will come back to that in a later slide with some video. Uh, the other one is we are pushing toward distributed simulation so that we can support, say, many drones in many areas, and it's all in one world, um, but it can render it and at a reasonable pace on multiple computers. So getting a little bit more into SIDL, uh, this is much more focused on what we're talking about here. Um, this is what you get if you run uh, make uh, PX4 SIDL default gazebo. It's a very exciting world. You've got asphalt and gray terrain. Um, and we're looking at this and we're saying, well, this is not give, showing off a lot of the power of what the SIDL can actually do. Uh, we'd like to actually take it and put some real terrain in. Um, so <clears throat> I went out and I downloaded a database from the USGS of the elevation data and the satellite imagery from McMillan Airfield. Um, I'm sure that several of you here have actually flown there. It's a drone testing field in California. Um, you can see there's the airfield. And this is good, um, but it's not really quite as compelling as, say, Yosemite Valley. I uh, did the same procedure, and here you can start to see, you can actually get the horizons and other things that are much more interesting to see um, when you're looking, th like looking through a cam simulated camera view. Uh, this is just flying around in the world. I'm showing you what's there, but we can do, um, we can do more, actually. Uh, we can start to throw in buildings and cities. Uh, this is San Carlos 
uh, right by the San Carlos airport. I modeled the airport, and then our graphic artist threw in buildings from uh, the region. So if you want to fly through an urban canyon, you can start to do that. And all of these have both visual aspects as well as collision aspects. So if you fly your drone into the building, it will tumble and crash. Uh, same thing with the walls of Yosemite Valley. If you hit the valley wall, it will start like cartwheeling down the valley. And of course, um, <clears throat> we have the ability to do anything else we want. Um, this isn't, you can't see this too well. Uh, this is, uh, I asked our artist to put together a drone playground. Uh, so you can see there are power lines, there's an overpass, there's trees, there's buildings, there's whatever we want, hoops to fly through. Um, and all of these things come in, they will render in the sensors, we can add the noise models. Um, so if you want to add testing, we should start making rich environments like this. And so one of the things I want to ask is that all of you out there, if you have use cases and you want to see an environment, um, please let me know. Uh, we have resources we will be putting into building up some stock environments uh, so that you can run tests. Uh, please think about that and get in contact with me afterwards so that I can have an idea of what you want. Um, if the better you can describe it, the better I can make it happen. And to give you a preview, this is all in Gazebo 9. Um, this is what things can look like in Ignition. Oh, and that is... How do I... Uh, but you can see this, is the, this includes the physics-based rendering. You can get much better effects as you go through. Um, <clears throat> the biggest limitation is actually the textures on the wall and having the bandwidth to actually create that. This was created by actually driving, walking through the tunnels, taking pictures of the walls and doing photogrammetric reconstruction of the walls, and then tessellating those throughout in an efficient way so that we could render it quickly. So, <clears throat> that's the SIDL. Uh, to do a lot of this work, I've been working on getting SIDL running inside of containers, in particular Docker. Um, these containers make it great. I don't have to actually have anything installed on my machine except for Docker and the NVIDIA drivers necessary to run it. So uh, the other cool thing is this actually works all the way from my moderately beefy developer laptop, but it also I've demonstrated on the tough pad uh, that many people use as flight control uh, ground, uh, controllers. And at this point, I will take the risk and do a live demo. Uh, so this is going to launch the SIDL inside of Docker with QGround Control and Gazebo and scripts to bring up quadcopters. In particular, I've restructured the way that we're launching this simulation. So you bring up the world with the end use parameterized and like this is default to Yosemite. I could put in Macmillan or San Carlos. And then I have a script that will then go along and inject a drone into that environment. So if you watch here, this is pretty familiar. This is the SIDL launching up, starting PX4, and it'll come up. Um, this is the gazebo window. Most of the time I run it headless, so we don't bother rendering it. But if I zoom in, There is a drone down here. Jump over to Q ground control. You can see the drone is here. Um, we have streaming video as well. Holy smoke, I've never seen it this big. Each of the drones has their own video streaming port. So the first drone is on 5600. Uh, there you see the streaming camera, and we can take off. Oop. 
Uh, we can also support multiple multiple drones of the same type or different types. I now asked it for to add a plane to this world. Um, so if we look, where's my window switcher? Here, there's now a plane sitting next to the quadcopter that's hovering. Come back to Q ground control. Switch to vehicle two. It's the plane, so we have to send it waypoints. Upload. And take off. And the plane's on its way as well. I'm sure you've all seen that, but none of this is installed on my computer. It's all running in the container. Uh, this is great for development, great for testing. You can have basically any computer with graphics drivers and um, Docker installed. You can run your tests. Um, I'm also looking to hope that this can be make things like continuous integration and testing easier as well. Shut it all down. Don't kill my. Okay. <clears throat> Back to the presentation. Uh, that's what I just showed you, so we'll skip that. Um, in addition to that, all of these instances that we're, I'm launching by default have the Mavros interface available. Um, so if you want to do something, you can have a small script that interacts with Mavros, connects to all the drones, and launches them to fly a formation flying. Uh, so these drones are going to take off. Uh, this is the work of my intern uh, back at the office. They're going to take off, fly a helical pattern, and then land. Um, they're all simulating cameras. They're all, everything is running. Um, but you can start to look at doing swarm formation operations. I promise you they land. We don't need to watch it all. Uh, so now I want to transition to looking ahead. A lot of this is what is going on right now, uh, the functionality that is currently available. Uh, Nuno is going to follow me and talk about the integrations with ROS2 that are currently in the tree and uh, exactly what's there. So I want to talk about sort of a bigger, bigger picture and vision looking forward of how ROS2 integration might actually happen. Um, one of the big things is that drones are a small subcategory of general robotics. Uh, there's a lot of functionality out there uh, that we can, as in the drone community, can take advantage of. And I'd like to see some of that be able to be leveraged here. Um, as an example, each of the bigger boxes is the drone. The top one is uh, a little bit bigger for it's easier to read. Um, but the most uh, first place that we think that ROS2 can be super valuable is within the communications within the drone. Uh, this is between the, P the PX4 and the companion computer. Uh, you can also start to do things like having sensors that are plug and play that talk ROS2, and they can plug into either the PX4 or the companion computer. There are a lot of sensors out there doing rich processing. There's image pipelines for processing, um, uh, point clouds, imaging, Etc. All of this is available in ROS and ROS2 um, for you to be able to pick up and you don't have to reinvent it. Some of the particular things for ROS2 that are valuable, um, it gives you introspectability. You can do things if the PX4 is publishing and available over ROS2 topics. You can go in and look at the internal state of some topic inside of the tool at runtime when you say, like, hey, I want to have access to that. Um, it's modular, which means that you can move things. Say you want to debug a library, um, you can actually launch it externally on the 
um, companion computer w inside of a debugger, wait for it to hit that space, uh, hit that edge case, and then you can pause and debug it in the on the companion computer, which is functionality that's much harder inside of the microcontroller. Once it works there, you recompile it and launch it back on the microcontroller. And <clears throat> as you start looking at drones and systems of drones, um, you also start looking at ground control stations, you start looking at ground robots, surface robots. There's a whole ecosystem of robots out there that you can talk to if you talk ROS. Um, so you can start doing collaborative environments with drones, heterogeneous drones, um, and uh, it can all just talk if we talk the same language. This has been the power of ROS, and I'd like to see that more in this community. For DDS in particular, with ROS2, I'd like to highlight a couple of things that are of particular value from listening to people in, uh, at the summit here. Uh, DDS has security plugins. It's X509 public key infra infrastructure, does authentication, access control, and encryption. Um, there is much better multi-robot support. It has dynamic discovery, so you don't have to worry about any of you that used a ROS master. Uh, you basically have to run one per drone because they might or might not have connectivity at some point. Um, it's fully distributed discovery, so you can have drones that wander in and out of the connectivity, and they'll keep working. Uh, we also have significant number of quality of service metrics that we can allow you to control where your drone, um, control how your communications happen, set priorities for different messages, set retry amounts. Uh, this lets you work much better in environments that are lossy Wi-Fi, which drones are. Um, this is because of these features. This is why DDS is the preferred communication layer of NASA. We're also I didn't mention that earlier. We're going to be working with them to get ROS2 into some production systems for them in upcoming projects as well. So, <clears throat> while I have your attention, I want to put in one small plug. Uh, Rep 147. Reps are the enhancement proposals for ROS, sort of how we do standards. Uh, this is one for standard aerial messages for drones. Um, I've been collaborating with Lorenz on this for several years. Uh, it's pretty mature, but if you have feedback, I'd love to hear it, because uh, I'm planning to push this out and stabilize it, or push it upstream pretty soon. Um, it's overdue, and I've been distracted with other projects. So, thank you. Is there, is there any questions from the audience? Here? Mike. I have too many, but let me just, let me just ask two. Uh, first one, uh, why call something an operating system that is decidedly not an operating system? It depends on your definition of an operating system. It sounds like you're talking about a computer operating system. Uh, it's more like a robot operating system. It provides all the functionality for a robot. That's where it came from. I see, okay. It just creates a lot of confusion with people who yep. hear about it for the first time. Uh, what is uh, the interaction, how do you see future between Mavlink and ROS? There is a lot of overlap between what they do, and it's, uh, so how do you see it? So ROS and ROS2 are a generic framework that allows you a lot more flexibility. Um, I think the power in ROS, ROS and ROS2 will be being able to do custom messages, large messages, high bandwidth messages. Uh, Mavlink is highly optimized for moderately small bandwidth data links. And I think for telemetry and other feature uh, functionality like that, the more optimized data format will be valuable. Um, it's, they're definitely sort of competing, uh, but ROS is never going to be as optimized for a very small pipeline. Uh, that downlink that uh, Mavlink has been optimized for. So I think they'll likely sit side by side for a long time. Just one more short question. So um, say I want to use different rendering engine. I don't know, Unreal or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, can I uh, benefit from all the uh, other functionality of, say, Gazebo, like sensors, modeling, and kind of that kind of thing with a different rendering? Yeah, so you can swap out the rendering engine. Uh, we have looked at, a lot of people have asked for Unreal rendering engine. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that all of the gaming rendering engines are basically fully integrated 
into their system. And in Gazebo and Ignition, we have nicely separated. There's physics, there's rendering, uh, there's sensor generation. And these are all nicely separated. Um, we have done co-simulation uh, co with Unreal, where you actually synchronize the state between the Unreal physics and the, or you, you turn off the Unreal physics and just push the Gazebo state over. Um, it's functional, uh, but it's, you don't really want to, like, it, we, we, have, we have proof of concept that it works. Uh, I have not seen anyone that actually wants to take that and use that effectively. Anyone else? Right there. The question is, how good are the physics in Gazebo? Uh, the physics are as good as you tune them. Um, basically, you have the option to dial it to say how often you want it to update. Uh, it's solving F equals MA. Our default is 1 kilohertz. Um, I have worked on projects that have taken it to 10 or 20 kilohertz. So every you know, half or a tenth of a millisecond, it's actually doing a physics update. And that's simulated time. So theoretically, if you want to slow it down that much, um, it, the real-time factor is going to hurt. Um, but it should be, we have enough accurate enough physics to do gr manipulation and grasping of objects on tabletops. But we can do humanoid walking robots that will walk with the real controller that's tuned for the hardware, and it'll walk in simulation without changing any gains. Um, also, the, all the drones you've seen just use the default hardware gains. I have a couple of questions regarding ROS2 and uh, the middleware that you use uh, DDS against uh, something like 0MQ. Um, is it possible to do remote procedure call in ROS2 right now or communication like request response other than just publish subscribe? Yes. Uh, we have support for publish subscribe. We have support for remote procedure calls. We call them services. And we have a concept called actions, which are preemptible remote procedure calls that will run in the background and give status updates as they're running. Um, also, uh, are ROS projects, you can build them just with default CMake, or do you need something else? And what about the dependencies that come with ROS2 now? So we worked hard to keep the dependencies within ROS2 as minimal as possible. Um, the majority of what we use leverage is in C++ 11 slash 14. Uh, we were able to remove boost. We were able to remove a bunch of other things. Some of our dependencies actually pull that back in. We're working on that with them to get rid of that. Um, the sorry, what was the other? Oh, the tool chain. So uh, we have a standard uh, build tool called Colcon, which will iterate through your packages and basically call CMake, make, make, install for you. Um, but if you want to do that manually, you can call CMake, make, make, install on each package. They install in a standard place. And what we provide is um, a little bit of, that we have CMake libraries that let you do that process easier, export targets. It'll export targets and include paths for you uh, so that you don't have to manually write all that boilerplate. Um, but you can just CMake, make, make, install, and it'll work from the install space. Uh, so I have a question on the gazebo side, since you were calling for a more realistic environments. Uh, relevant for drones, did you work on or have plans for simulating external conditions such as wind or temperature or magnetic field uh, conditions? I think these are very relevant for drones. Yep. Um, I know we have a wind plug-in, um, and we also have a magnetic field plug-in. Um, I'm not personally familiar with them. I know that I added uh, a third dimension to the wind plug-in. For a long time, the, th the wind plug-in was uh, only 2D. And the third dimension just happened to be the combinatoric sum of the x and y, uh, which is tough when I started testing at like 20 knot wind. Suddenly the drone was falling out of the sky at 20 knots. Um, so there are, they're definitely there, and that's where that extensibility API is. You can add whatever you want. You can have in the physics update, um, the lift drag plugin actually takes into account the wind uh, concept. We have space for one more question. Let me give the space for someone else. Did you get the question, or do you need me to? Uh, yeah, so the, the question is, what sort of aerodynamics do we have in there? Are we planning to put more in? Um, so we currently have a first-order approximation of lift drag. 
Um, it takes the frontal area of an item, takes the aspect ratio, and computes the first order lift drag. Uh, this is enough to get lift in a realistic manner out of propellers. Um, and we also, the plane is flying with the lifting surfaces of the, the wings are providing the lift, as well as the elevators and rudder. Um, so I, if there is needs for more of this, we can definitely look at adding that. It's certainly add, uh, possible to add. Um, so far, this has not been the demand that we've seen. Uh, I think the, the most valuable aspect of SIDL will be providing the functionality to have the higher level behaviors instead of working to specifically tune the, like, hardware ga the controller gains for the hardware. All right. Uh, thank you, Tuli. Please send our love to our civilian community of Ross. Uh, thank you. Thank you.